All right, and now we're moving on to gravitation. What we covered so far about gravity treated it as a constant force so that wherever you are on the surface of the Earth, you experience roughly the same um, gravitational force always pointing downward. Of course, real gravity, you know, when you, when you consider scales that are um, large compared to the, um, the radius of the Earth, um, or on the order of the radius of the Earth, then you have to start worrying about the, um, the fuller form of gravity. Um, so here you can see the general equation. This is for the magnitude of the force, not the direction. Um, what Newton's law of gravity says is that uh, if you have any two masses, m1 and m2, the force of gravity, there will be a force of gravitation between them attracting them. So that there is a force on M1 pulling it towards M2, as well as a force on M2 pulling it towards M1. The forces are equal and opposite. And the direction is pointing towards them, so this only gives the magnitude. The gravitational constant G, capital G, is about 6 times 10 to the negative 11th. Um, it has to have, you have to end up with units of force. So, uh, so G, so this says the, the force is proportional to the product of the masses and the square of the distance between them. Um, so if we watch our units, capital G has units of meters cubed per kilogram second squared. And then when we multiply by the mass squared, we get kilograms squared and we are dividing by meters squared. We watch our units. We end up getting units of kilogram meters per second squared, which you will recognize as the units of a force. And this says that the further, the closer two objects are, the greater the, the gravitational force between them. The, uh, and the, the magnitude of the force falls off as the distance squared. Um, and this is actually what describes the attraction between the planets and, and, and the sun. Um, so, um, our universe has billions of gravities. All of them are, uh, in, all of them are attracted to each other gravitationally. Um, and gravity is ultimately responsible for the output of all stars because the, because, um, the fact that these stars are so massive, they're actually being pulled inward toward themselves. Um, that can start thermonuclear reactions, and it allows the sun, which allows the sun to heat the Earth. So we wouldn't be here without gravity. Um, and this makes gra galaxies visible from, um, uh, from over huge distances because we're actually seeing the, the light from those, um, from those thermonuclear reactions. Um, and then, um, okay, so this is how the gravitational force works. You draw a line between the, you, the centers of masses of the two objects, and gravity at, uh, attracts the two objects along the, um, uh, along the line joining the centers of masses. Here is an example of an apparatus which was used to measure gravity initially. It's amazing sometimes when you look at these old, um, these old experimental apparatuses that they even worked because gravity is a very small force. Like it's large when the masses are large, but, uh, but compared to the electromagnetic force um, or the forces that keep the nuclei together, um, this is a teeny tiny force, and this is a, so this is a very very hard um, measurement to do. So what you do is that you have two um, you have two stationary spheres, spheres capital N, so big spheres capital M. Because of Newton's law of gravity, any object should actually be attracted um, to any other object, and then you have two smaller spheres that are roughly identical, um, and they are. Uh, they are suspended from a wire, um, and you actually can measure, um, you can see how they rotate and measure that they are in fact, uh, that they are in fact pulled together. 
Okay, so gravita the gravitational constant and the gravitational field. Um, so when we have uh, the, when we're considering what happens on the, near the surface of the Earth, what we can do, and I'm going to do, I'm going to show you how this works. So if you have, if you look at the magnitude of the force between um, any object and the Earth, the mass of the Earth is huge. The mass of the object is small. And if you're near the surface of the Earth, you can write that radius as the radius of the Earth plus the height from the Earth. So here you get that the, um, the distance goes like uh, RE plus Y squared. Okay, now Y is a small number. You, you are usually, if, if I jump, I'm not close to jumping anything comparable to the radius of the Earth. And that's not even because I'm bad at basketball. Um, you know, I, I'm five foot two, I'm short. Not a good basketball player, but even, even the best, uh, even the best basketball player can't jump that high. This y is very small compared to the radius of the Earth. This mass is m is very capital M is very large compared to the mass of uh, of most things on the surface of the Earth. Though technically the Earth is gravitationally attracted to you, you're not big enough. The Earth doesn't care. You're not moving the Earth around. So near the surface of the Earth, um, we actually can treat that height as roughly constant. So near the surface of the Earth, the gravitational force is roughly GME over RE squared. So if you actually take the radius of the Earth and the mass of the Earth and Newton's gravitational constant and plug it in, you will get, a, 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 and this is times the, the mass of the, the object. So if you plug these numbers in, you will get that this is, in fact, approximately equal to your friendly uh, 9.81 meters per second squared. Um, and if you want to get super fancy, you could, you could expand this in terms of um, y over the radius of the Earth, get corrections to that, but... This is pretty close to a constant, as long as you're near the surface of the Earth. All right. Now, if you are inside the Earth, something funny happens. So we're treating the Earth as if it is exactly at the center of, exactly at its center of mass. Um, an interesting exercise for the reader, for the, the student, would be to calculate if you have a non-uniform but radially symmetric um, distribution of mass, what is, the, um, what, is the, what is the gravitational force? It is left as an exercise to the student to show that actually any time that you are, if you have a radially symmetric mass distribution, you can always treat it as if it is at the, uh, as if the mass is exactly at the center. Um, and even for slightly uh, non-isotropic distributions, you can, you end up being able to approximate everything is at the mass of the, at the center of mass. But inside the Earth, um, you actually get uh, so you actually get a slightly different answer um, because you, uh, if you're inside the Earth, you are gravitationally attracted towards the center from this stuff, but the stuff that is outside of you um, is going to. It, it, you're, it, it turns out that it has no net effect on you. So, the, so if you look at the acceleration inside the Earth, it increases at first, and then there is a, an area where there's less density. Um, and then as you go, once you reach the surface of the Earth, the, um, the force of gravity falls off 
like uh, 1 over r squared. So, what we do is that we actually, instead of simply, um, we often want to ask the question, okay, what is, what would an arbitrary object do because of some mass? So, you aren't necessarily, you want to be able to quantify what's going on without necessarily knowing, say, the, ma the mass of the object that you're putting in this sample. So what we do is, that, what we define is that we define the gravitational field. And the gravitational field is G times the mass, for, for a single object, is G times the mass times the distance from the center of that object, and then pointing towards that object. I'll, I'll denote it as R hat. So here you can see what that looks like. That um, if you, and the gravitational, this is the gravitational field, and your book denotes this with G, the gravitational field is always going to point towards the object, and it points in towards the center. And the gravitational force that a specific object has on, due to that gravitational field is the mass times g. Now, this lets you write the, the describe what's going on due to all of the masses in some environment without worrying about the mass of the object you're, you're considering. So for instance, um, if you are considering the gravitational field inside our galaxy, you might have a, you're going to have a much more complicated set of fields, but you can, um, the arrows would show you the direction of the force uh, of any test object. So if I go out into outer space, the, the field arrows are going to tell me where I would travel. And the same thing if you take a semi-truck and put it into outer space. I have no idea how you would do that, but I'm a physicist. I don't have to worry about how. That's not my problem. Semi-truck is much heavier than I am, but the field is going to, but the, the field experienced by this, the gravitational field experienced by a semi-truck is the exact same as the gravitational field that I experience. The introduction of fields is going to really make a lot more sense when you get to electricity and dynamics and magnetism, um, but it does also make a little more sense if you're talking about the gravitational field in a galaxy rather than on Earth. Near the surface of the Earth, our gravita the gravitational force is basically always the same. It's always pointing towards the center of the Earth. But when you get out into outer space, you will start seeing um, other objects that are going to, to distort the gravitational field. Okay, and then, um, this is a slight subtle effect that, um, well, there's a few different subtle effects if you want to consider gravity quantitatively. And the first one is that we have so far actually approximated the Earth as, um, as uniform and as a sphere. It turns out that the Earth is actually a little bit squishy near the middle. It's a little bit wider at the middle than it is um, at the top, and that's and that is because it's deformed by its own rotation. So you actually will have, uh, if you are closer to the, to the equator, the gravitational force is ever so slightly larger than, um, than if you are up near the North Pole. Now, another effect is that the Earth is not totally stationary. So as, as you well know, um, there is an acceleration due to the, the Earth rotating. So, when you are standing here on the surface of the Earth, you experience, um, you experience gravity pointing directly toward the center of the Earth, but unless you are exactly at the equator, um, the acceleration, your acceleration is not um, in the same direction as the, as the force due to gravity. If you are um, if you are accelerating, um, be, because you're accelerating because you're on the surface of the Earth, you actually have a net centripetal acceleration in this direction, um, which is ever so slightly off 
um, from uh, from the uh, the centripetal acceleration is going to is going to slightly change your net total acceleration. Um, so it, as you get closer and closer to um, at the equator, this effect be becomes more and more negligible. Okay, now in a gravitational, we're going to define the work in a gravitational force. Um, so remember, um, so when we do work, we're talking about the force um, dotted with the displacement or Hopefully by now in your calculus class, you're getting a little more comfortable with, uh, with calculus, except that you might not have seen, um, you, you might not have seen integrals yet, because often you see that in the second semester. Um, okay, so you're looking at the force dotted with the displacement. So if you ask how much, is, how much force is done, um, then if you are traveling in a circle, your displacement is perpendicular to the force. And therefore, if you travel in a circle, you have no work done by gravity. However, if you travel along this path, um, then you are going to do work. So we can take our force of gravity between two different um, objects. And we're going to integrate from infinity to some distance, I will call it capital R. And bear with me if you haven't got through the calculus yet. Um, And I wanted to do, ah, I wanted to go from R to infinity. So I'm coming in from infinity, I'm going to R. And then the work that I have done GMM over R, so GMM over infinity is zero. So if I travel from infinity and I come in, I am, actually I did want, I did want to switch these. Um, I lose, I, I, because I am actually, I want to switch them because I want to go from um, infinity to R. I'm coming in and my uh, sign turns out to be negative. I reduce the amount of energy in the system if I come in from infinity. Um, so gravity is, a, is an attractive force. So when I, um, when I come in from infinity, I am actually decreasing the energy configuration of my system. There's less and less potential energy in my system when I uh, than if I were not near a large mass. So this tells you what the, this is also the form of the potential energy due to gravity when we consider um, large distances. And if you consider things close to the surface of the Earth. This is approximately equal to GMM over R plus Y, um, which is negative GMM over R times 1 over 1 plus y over the radius of the earth. And this is approximately negative gmm over r times 1 minus y over the radius of the earth. 
So if you go up a distance y, your, uh, your potential energy increases. All right, and what I did here was just take a, for those of you who are already comfortable with calculus, I took a Taylor series of this term and just took the first term. And I should mention that our mathematicians in the audience are going to blanch a little bit because I'm treating infinity like a number and not doing a proper integral, or sorry, not doing a proper limit. I'm doing it because I'm a physicist and I can get away with it. I know what the answer is, so I'm going to be lazy and not write all, all of the notation that I would have to do for writing out a limit. I know I should, but I can get away with being sloppy about the math because I know what the right answer is and it's physics, so everything works out to be neat in the end anyways. All right. So... Then we're left with orbits. So Newton's law of gravity tells us how um, objects are attracted to each other. And then if you consider only two objects, um, we actually can only exactly solve the case of two objects, um, you, have, uh, you have stable orbits. And the one that we consider most often is a roughly circular orbit. We do that because the math is easier. It turns out that there that two objects that will have stable orbits, which can well, two objects will have um, will move around each other, um, either in they can have a circular orbit, an elliptical orbit, or they can have a hyperbolic trajectory. Um, and the hyperbolic trajectory is not stable, um, but the circular and the elliptical orbits all. Are. Um, and it turns out that most of the orbitals of most most of the orbits of the planets that orbit our sun in our solar system are roughly circular. We don't really know why, or at least I don't really know why, um, but they're roughly circular. So to good approximation, we can treat them like circular orbits. So then, if you consider uh, um, if you consider a satellite orbiting um, at a given radius then you have, uh, so the gravitational force is what actually provide, provides the centripetal acceleration. So because we know, know um, what a, so we know what the force is on an object um, going, uh, undergoing circular motion is, it's V squared over R, um, and so the acceleration is V squared over R, so the force is MV squared over R, and this is equal to g m m over r squared when two objects are attracted through gravity. We get a bunch of cancellations, or at least a couple. And we get that the velocity is proportional to, the velocity squared is proportional to g m over r. So. If you have a satellite and you want it to orbit at a certain um, radius, that tells you how fast it's going if you want a circular orbit. Um, so then you can, um, it, what you see here is that the larger the radius, the smaller the speed. The smaller the radius, the larger the speed. So if you've got stuff that's really close to Earth, it's got to go pretty fast to stay in an orbit. We haven't talked about how you get there. That's another matter entirely. But if you have a circular orbit, you're just putting together a few things that you've, that you've learned already in a first semester physics class. And that tells you what the, um, the relationship between the speed and the radius. So if you have a circular orbit where you're, say, launching something directly um, from the surface of the Earth. Um, what's really happening is the object is falling, because gravity, you, you can think of it as causing things to fall. The object is falling at a rate so that it's always falling towards the center. So it's going, it's going tangential to its um, trajectory, and it's just always falling. It never quite makes it to, to hitting the Earth. Um, so 
Then if you have the um, a slight difference, if, if you have two galaxies, um, the distance between the two galaxies which, galaxies, which determines the force between them, is the, um, is the, the distance here, but they're actually orbiting around the center of mass. Um, so they're orbiting around the center of mass of the system, um, even though the net force of gravity is, um, is going to be impacted by the distance between the two centers of, centers of masses. All right, now we move to Kepler's locks. We're not gonna derive them in this class. If you continue on to upper division classical mechanics, you will learn how to derive them. Um, Kepler's first law states that every planet moves along an ellipse with the sun located at, the, at one of the foci of the ellipse. So all trajectories are ellipses. And then, of course, we can take our handy dandy Newton's law of gravity. Um, this is the force and the potential energy is GM M over R, and the kinetic energy is one half mv squared. So the total energy is G M M over R squared plus one half m v squared. In an elliptical orbit, so in a circular orbit, you have a constant. Um, you have move with a constant um, with a constant tangential velocity. In an elliptical orbit, you do not. So when you are close to, uh, there should be a negative sign. When you are close to the, um, when you are close to the sun, you have the least potential energy. When you're far from the sun, you have the most potential energy. So because you have the least potential energy here, you are moving fastest. You're, you're falling towards the earth here, you're closest. You, so, so here your speed is fastest because you have the least potential energy. Here you have the most potential energy, so your speed is slowest. So if you move along an elliptical orbit, you're fastest here, and then you're going to slow down out there, and then you're going to speed up and slow down. So the speed of, the, of an elliptical orbit is not constant. And um, we usually measure, so you measure the angle of the, um, of the object relative to the, um, the x-axis, which so the major axis of the ellipse. Okay, and this is showing, so it turns out that each of the trajectories is a conic section. So you can get a circle, an ellipse, a parabola, or a hyperbola. And then uh, there's all sorts of um, there's all sorts of terminology when you come to orbits because this is one of the first things that people studied in physics. So they uh, they came up with all sorts of names for everything. I admit I have to look them up every time. Astronomy is not my thing. I haven't memorized them. I never use them. I don't use them except when I'm teaching physics. So there's no shame in having to look it up every single time. But I would recommend that you keep notes down um, if you get to have an equation sheet when you are doing your, uh, working on your exam. Keep notes um, and have the definitions written down somewhere. Okay, so if you wanted to get, a, um, if you wanted to get an orbit to Mars, what you can do is that you Take something which is in Earth's orbit when you are um, uh, here. Sorry, this is the orbit of Earth around the sun. So here you've got the orbit of Earth around the sun. And then here you give it a little extra trans a, a, a little extra tangential momentum. And that's going to kick it into an orbit like this. 
but this is now an elliptical orbit around the sun because you gave it just a little bit of extra kinetic energy here. Um, and then here, you got to give it a little bit more, um, a little bit more momentum to get moving with, um, to get moving with Mars. Okay, and this is Kepler's second law. Kepler's second law says that equal areas are swept out uh, by in equal times by anything, uh, any orbit of the. Um, by any orbit around the sun. Now that's a little bit of a funny way to formulate that. So what that means is that if you look at any given point in the, um, in the orbit, and these are a little bit harder to see, this area, if this is the amount swept out in, these are all swept out in the same amount of time. Each of these areas is equal to each other. That involves a little bit of tricky geometry to show that that's true. Again, if you continue on to upper level mechanics, it's a standard derivation. Okay, so, uh, and here, here you actually can use the, this is one of the, all right, this is one of the derivations. You can actually use the conservation of angular momentum. So here, the angular momentum is the moment arm, the cross product of the moment arm with the velocity. And when you are, um, so when you are at a, given point in the orbit, so you have an angle theta, your angular momentum is m r v sine of the angle theta with the angular momentum, or sorry, the sine theta of the angular angle between the moment arm and the velocity. So this is your moment arm, this is your velocity. That's just from the definition of the, um, of the, uh, of the cross product. So then your change in area in a given point in time is going to be the length of the triangle times the height of the triangle times two because, sorry, times one half. So the change in area um, that you have swept out is This is R, and then you can draw the height of this triangle. We're going to use this triangle. The height of this triangle is the velocity times the change in time times sine theta. And then there's the factor of 2 because it's a triangle. And then... This is delta A in a small chunk of time, delta T. So dA dt is 1 half times the velocity times r times sine theta. Now we can go look at our definition of the angular momentum and see that this is the angular momentum divided by twice the mass. Because the, ang the angular momentum has to be constant because the gravitational force cannot provide a torque. The gravitational force is always parallel to the moment arm. So, um, the, so R cross F, the torque caused by the gravitational force, is always equal to zero. So, the angular momentum is constant, and, because, and this means, because the, the change in area per unit time is the angular momentum, divided by twice the mass, the change in, it, in area per unit time is constant as well. All right, and then we get to Kepler's third law. Kepler's third law, it says that the period squared is, equal, is proportional to the area cubed. So if you have a given orbit, um, 
No, sorry, the, this is not the area cube. This is the major axis cubed. So this is for, uh, for an ellipse. This is the major axis. For a circular orbit, this is the radius of the orbit. Um, so this is a little trickier to, to derive, um, but that one also comes in, that one comes in handy for some of the problems in the book. Then we come to tides. Uh, when we consider tides, it turns out that it actually matters which side is closer to, um, which side of the Earth is closest to the moon. So when we talk about a gravitational force between two static objects, we are assuming that those objects do not deform. When you talk about the, um, about the water on the surface of the Earth, the water on the surface of the Earth actually can deform, um, and it does. So when you are, so if you have, because we have the moon orbiting around the Earth, the moon is actually pulling water towards it. So the moon is going to deform the water on the sur surface of the Earth, and this figure is greatly exaggerated, but it's going to pull more water along here so that there is more, um, so that there's more water in this direction. Um, so there's a tidal bulge on both sides of the planet because it's actually the difference between the, the gravitational force on this side and that side because the moon is closer, the moon's closer to here. Um, so the, it turns out that the tidal variations on the ocean are on the order of a few meters. So this is greatly exaggerated, but that's the basic principle of tides. And here this shows that uh, the forces, um, so the tidal force is the difference between the gravitational force at the center and that elsewhere. So here, if you're on this, so this, here's the moon. I can draw a circle. I'm not much of an artist, but I can draw a circle, kind of. So when you are here, the, um, the force on the, um, the force on, from the, on the earth from the moon is slightly larger than if you are here. If you're here, I'm going to draw this and exaggerate. And if you're way over here, this is the force. So then, if you take your, your tidal force here is the difference between this vector and this vector. That's how you get this vector. The tidal force here is the difference between this vector and that vector, which is how you get this vector. Um, and that leads to an apparent force. So you end up with, uh, that leads to a force which ends up with the, the because the force on the moon is, um, the force from the moon on the ocean has, uh, it's pushing it out then in both directions around the, um, around the earth. And spring tides occur when the sun and the moon are aligned. So you actually will get a slight, um, you, you will get a, a slight effect from the sun as well, because the sun um, also affects the closer side of the earth more than the, um, the farther side of the earth. So in this, so in the um, spring tides, um, you have them aligned. And in, uh, in neap tides, so you don't have them aligned. So stuff, so then you actually have slight distortions because the moon is closer, but the sun's actually going to decrease it because this bulge, um, the, the, Moon is pulling on it to create a bulge in the direction of the moon, 
the sun slightly flattens that out because the, the sun is creating its own bulge in a little bit of a different direction. And of course, oh, this doesn't render when you're doing the light board, but good enough. So these tides can be major effects so that you can end up um, at high tide. Uh, you've got a boat sitting high in the water, whereas you might end up with a boat um, grounded when you've got low tides. And the um, tidal forces on Io, the, um, the moon of Jupiter, are, uh, can be huge because the, um, because the distances are shorter and, <clears throat> and that actually creates massive heat, uh, massive amounts of um, internal heat from the tidal forces on Io. And we're used to thinking about its impact, the impact of tides on the Earth, but tides also impact galaxies. So here you see a, a um, very compact object and it's orbiting, um, it's orbiting, it's being orbited by a star and the tidal force is, is enough that it can actually tear matter away from the orbiting star. Um, and this is called uh, an accretion disk. This creates an accretion disk. And we're going to briefly introduce the concepts of general relativity. Um, so um, that's what we've so far considered a constant gravitational field, but it turns out that gravity is not, um, you can think of it as gravity distorting the, um, distorting the, um, the space-time fabric. So uh, if you um, consider things carefully, um, it turns out that you can actually measure some of these effects. It's called general relativity. Um, and we start with a principle of equivalence, which says that if you Form, perform experiments in the same gravitational field. Um, if you perform experiments in a uniformly accelerating gravitational, uh, a uniformly accelerating laboratory, it's going to look exactly the same as what you get in a uniform gravitational field. Um, but in, and then you have a large mass distorting space time of the of a, of um, that is experienced by a smaller mass and vice versa. And the larger an object, the more distortions you have. And you can actually see the impact of this on trajectories so that if, if you look at the way that things move about in our galaxy, then um, you can see the, um, the impact of the distortions um, in the, in the orbitals uh, followed by objects in our gal galaxy. Uh, this gives you, uh, you can also use this to, to estimate what's going on. Um, you can calculate the speed of rotation of objects in the galaxy um, based on how much matter is, and the radial distribution of matter. And this shows what you expect based on the visible matter. This is what you observe. So you can actually calculate that that means that you would need extra matter in order to account for the higher, um, the higher orbital velocity that we actually observe in the galaxy. And this is the matter called dark matter. And it's called dark matter because it doesn't emit light. We can only ca take into account the material that we can actually see. And it accounts for most of the matter in the universe, so we don't understand most of the matter in the universe. All right. Moving on to, um, to one example. So here you see um, a diagram for a satellite in an elliptical orbit about a much larger mass. Where is its speed greatest and where is its speed least? Um, so here we've got the larger mass. Here the potential energy is lowest. So the speed is greatest here and the speed is least here. Um, and it says, so indicate the direction of the force, the acceleration, and the velocity at these points. So this is the velocity. The, 
force is going to be largest here, and the acceleration is going to point in the same direction. The force is going to be smallest here, and the acceleration likewise is going to be smallest here. And then we can do the same thing for the points here. Now we're always going to have an orbital velocity which is tangential to the curve. Now I'm trying to draw an arrow which is between the lengths of these two. My acceleration is always going to point, my acceleration and my force are always going to point towards the heavy mass. So this is the direction of my force and my acceleration. And I have the largest force in acceleration here and the smallest force and acceleration there. All right, and with that, we'll end gravity.